Kia ora. In this video we're going to take a look at the idea of viscosity and viscous flow. So when we talk about viscosity of a liquid, what we're referring to is the property that makes it kind of thick or sticky. So picture for example tipping liquid honey out of a jar. Um, it is quite resistant to flowing, it kind of oozes out. That's because it has a really high viscosity. So all liquids have viscosity to some extent, um, but some of them are more viscous or more thick and oozy than others. So we're going to learn about how we can study the flow of viscous fluids in pipes. And it turns out that there's a nice equation that helps us understand what's going on. So we're going to begin with a little bit of a recap. Um, we talked about shear stress back in our video on stresses and strains. We didn't, we didn't really talk much about it other than to mention that it's a thing that exists. So let's just have a quick reminder about what that was. So here's the shear stress and strain for a solid. So we're in solid mode just for a second. Um, so we're applying a force parallel to the top face of our solid, for example our sponge. And what we find is that the solid tends to turn itself into a parallelogram type shape like this one here. So we defined our shear stress to be that force divided by the area. Now the area is the area on the top of our solid. And we, just, we defined the shear strain to be a slightly weird one. It's the change in length divided by the starting length, but the change in length is this way, whereas the starting length is up and downwards. So that's kind of how a solid behaves. We apply a certain force, it deforms a certain amount, and then we can look at what the change in length are is uh, along that direction and work out our stress and strain. Now if we do this to a liquid, so imagine instead of having our sponge here, um, we've got sort of a layer of liquid in the gap. And one of the things that sort of defines how liquids behave is that if we apply this kind of force and there's a liquid in between, say a plate on the bottom and the top here, then rather than just deforming to a certain position and staying there, essentially the liquid will start to flow and our plate along the top here will just go moving off this way at a certain speed. So when we're talking about shear stresses on fluids, it makes more sense to wonder what's going on with the speed at which it's moving. So instead of using strain, we use a thing called a strain rate, like how much that length is changing over time. And then we, we do still normalize it by that thickness like we've done previously. So here's the sort of idealization of that situation. We've got a stationary solid blue plate on the bottom here, and we've got a moving plate that's being pushed in that direction F um, along the top. And what we should see happen is that a velocity v will develop over time. Um, we also have uh, the thickness, we'll just call it L now because that's the only length we're going to be dealing with. That will be the thickness and what you'll notice if we were able to measure it is that across our layer of fluid, so this is, has a certain thickness, the velocity gets bigger and bigger, uh, almost in a straight line, as we go up. So the top layer of the fluid or the, is moving at the same speed as that plate at the top is. Bottom layer is basically stationary and then the velocity increases as we go up there. Okay, so let's just highlight our key quantities. One of these is the shear strain rate. So this is the equivalent thing to our strain, but when we've got a fluid we talk about the strain late, uh, rate instead. So we define that just to be that velocity uh, divided by the thickness of the fluid layer. And we can use this to define our viscosity. So we take the viscosity, which is yet another Greek symbol, this one is called eta. Uh, our viscosity is equal to the shear stress, that's our F over A from before. Um, so the area is the area across the top surface, and we divide it by our shear strain rate instead of by our strain. Okay, and if you just do a little bit of messing around with the units, you find that the units of viscosity are pascal seconds. So what does that mean? Well, viscosity is a number that applies to the type of fluid. So you might look up in a book what the viscosity is for a certain thing, and that will be a number. Um, and if you've got a fluid with a high viscosity, that means that the fluid flows less easily. So that's like the honey in the jar that we just talked about. If we have a fluid with low viscosity, then that's a fluid that flows very easily, for example, water. So it's a, it's a property of the fluid that we can kind of figure out, um, and that's sort of where it comes from. 
Right, so, um, when we have a flow of a liquid in a pipe, you can kind of see the difference between viscous flow and non-viscous or inviscid flow by a couple of things. First off, if you have no viscosity, so that's what we've kind of been assuming up to this point, then the flow will be the same speed at every part of the pipe. So if you imagine this is liquid sort of flowing down a pipe here, um, and you were to take a cross section, then it would be in nice layers, everything's moving at the same speed, it's just moving as a solid block along. There's no stickiness or anything like that, it's just flowing sort of very uniformly. Whereas when we have viscosity, that's not what happens. In viscosity, the bits closest to the edge basically have pretty much no velocity, whereas the flow of the fluid in the middle of the pipe is faster. So what that means is the fluid in the middle is moving quicker, so that means it's rubbing on the fluid beside it um, and sort of as it goes past, because if one thing's going faster than another, then they're going to naturally sort of rub against each other. And that sort of basically requires some energy and it's going to sort of, it's a little bit like a friction force, right? So the more of that you get, the more energy it's going to lose. And so the result that we see is that our pressure is actually going to decrease along the pipe. So pressure will decrease. Whereas in this case, if our pipe is horizontal, our pressure will stay the same. So the, with, our, with our sort of non-viscous situation, this was governed by uh, Bernoulli's equation, and the pressure would stay the same if our velocity and our area stayed the same. Whereas for visco a viscous fluid, the pressure is going to decrease due to this friction, uh, internal friction inside the fluid as it's flowing. So another way of interpreting that is to make fluid flow where there's viscosity, you have to apply a higher pressure at one end and corresponding, and there'll be a lower pressure at the other end, and that will be the driving force that makes that pumps your liquid down the pipe. Okay, so that's the, the difference. Um, there, and there is an equation that we can work with that lets us kind of understand how this works. So one little note before we look at that, we are only gonna consider what we call Newtonian fluids. Now we don't need to, we're not gonna make a great point about what this is, but essentially, Newtonian fluids are the well-behaved case where everything works nicely. And it turns out that no matter what the shear strain rate that you're applying, you'll get the same um, viscosity at different shear strain rates. Some fluids behave quite differently depending on how much shear stress you're putting on them. Uh, we're, we're not going to worry about that kind of weirdness. We're just going to go for kind of the standard fluid where everything is just governed by this single viscosity number. Right, so there is an equation that basically tells us everything we need to know uh, approximately about how fluid is going to flow in a pipe. So let's just maybe break it down and explain what every piece of this equation is. So we have a, we have a pipe full of some kind of viscous fluid. P1 and P2, these are the pressures at the two ends. So P1 will be the pressure at our starting end, and P2 will be our pressure at this end. And if P1 is bigger than P2, which normally is how we'd set it up, then our flow is going to be in that direction. So Q is our flow rate. That's the, fl the, uh, the Q in our equation, and that will be in our standard units of cubic meters per second. Right, let's work out what some of these other terms are. Pi is just pi, the mathematical pi. R, that's the radius of the pipe. So confusingly, sometimes we use diameter in these equations and sometimes we use radius. That is our radius R, just there. Um, eta, that's our viscosity, as we just talked about. And then L, that is the length of our pipe, because the longer our pipe, um, the more pressure we're going to need to get the same amount of flow. So that's got to be relevant in our equation. So essentially this says, if we take a liquid of viscosity eta and apply a certain pressure, this is sometimes called, um, this might sometimes be called delta P, a certain pressure difference across the two ends of the pipe, then this tells me how much fluid is going to flow. So if I apply a pressure at one end and the other end is at zero or whatever, then this equation will tell us how much liquid we're going to have flowing. 
This is definitely best illustrated with an example, so we'll jump straight into one of those. So here's an example. A drug is delivered to a patient via a syringe that is five centimeters long with an internal diameter one millimeter at a rate of 10 mils per minute. Okay, so we've got a little bit going on with this question. Maybe the first thing we'll do is just draw a wee diagram. So we've got a five centimeter long syringe. Hey, we're not worrying about the needle bit. We're just worrying about the syringe part of it. Um, the internal diameter, so we've got a little spanner thrown in the works here. That is our diameter, D. That's one centimeter. Um, oh, sorry, five, one millimeter. We've got five centimeters along here. And we have been given a, actually been given a flow rate of 10 mils per minute. So this is Q, but just expressed in a strange unit. Okay, so the drug has viscosity um, of eta, and we have to de determine the flow rate of the drug and also find the pressure that we'd require to apply to our syringe in order to make this flow happen. So let's just see what we need to do here. So this, we've actually been given the flow rate Q. So our first job for part A is just to find out what Q is um, in our standard units. So we know, so for part A, we know that Q is equal to 10 milliliters per minute. So this is an example for us to practice um, our unit conversions. So one milliliter is one thousandth of a liter, which in turn is one thousandth of a cubic meter. So that's going to be 10, and one milliliter is going to be 10 to the negative six cubic meters. And we also know that um, one minute is 60 seconds. So our flow rate will therefore be 10 times 10 to the negative six divided by 60, which is 1.667 times 10 to the negative seven cubic meters per second. Um, and if I was going to round that, I'd say to two significant figures, um, I'd round that to 1.7. So that is my flow rate. The question is asking me for the pressure. So essentially I have to take my Poisson equation here, that's how you say it by the way, um, and we want to rearrange it for the pressure difference. So when it asks for the required pressure in the syringe, it's really asking what the pressure between the two ends has got to be. So it's asking for P1 minus P2. So to do this, I'm going to have to rearrange my equations. So let's maybe change colors. So my equation starts as being Q equals pi r to the four divided by eight eta. It's like an N with a stick on the bottom, L times P1 minus P2. And just for a bit of math practice, we can get rid of a fraction that's multiplying something by multiplying by the reciprocal. So let's just do a little quick reminder of what that means up the top here. If I've got a situation like this, three quarters x equals five, and I want x, um, maybe you know that we can multiply by four and divide by three to get this, but you can do this in one hit by just multiplying by what we call the reciprocal of the fraction, which is the same fraction, just the other way up. So I would multiply both sides of my equation by this, and the nice thing about that is the, these things will cancel off and turn into a one. And so I'd get X in that example, X would be 20 over three. All right, so why am I doing that? Well, basically I'm doing that because I want to get rid of this big fraction here. And the fastest way of getting rid of it is just to multiply by its reciprocal. So also writing the fraction back the other way around, this means that P1 minus P2 is going to be equal to that reciprocal, eight e to L over pi r to the four, all times Q. So to answer our question, we just got to substitute everything in. So that will be equals um, eight e to L, eight times viscosity was given to us as 8.9 times 10 to the negative four, times our length in, in meters, so that's going to be 0 
meters, so times 0 0.05, um, divided by pi times a radius. Now radius is half the diameter, so r will be 0 0.0005 meters. That's half a millimeter um, expressed in meters. So it's going to be times 0 0.0005 to the power of 4. Um, what else have we got to put in there? That's everything, I think. All times our flow rate Q, times Q. So times 1.667 times 10 to the negative 7. Okay, now this, these you've got to, just got to be a little bit careful on your calculator to make sure you put brackets around the right things. So I'm going to just be brave and type this all in in one go. Um, first thing I'm going to do is store my last result in a variable called Q. Um, if you're wondering how that works. So I can reuse Q later. <laughs> I will get, so let's just type that all in. So it's going to be 8 times 8.9 times 10 to the negative 4 times 0 0.05 divided by, now I need to make sure I open a bracket, pi times my radius 0 0.0005 to the power of 4. Now on my calculator, the way to do power of 4 is with that little carrot, just like the top of a triangle symbol, so you can see that there. Here we are so far. And with a bit of luck, we get something useful. And my answer is, and do it in a different colour just to emphasise it, is approximately 300, or well, 302.18. So let's just round it to two significant figures, it'll be 300 pascals. Yep, that's right. So uh, our pressure required to push that much fluid through our liquid, uh, liquid through our syringe, sorry, is going to be 300 pascals um, between the two ends of the cylinder. So that means the difference in pressure between this point here and this point here would be 300 pascals. So you could also work out how much force would be required um, to push on that point as well to work out what, um, yeah, what force you'd have to apply to the syringe to get that much pressure built up. But we won't do that right now. Cool. In our next video, we'll just sort of continue along this line of viscous flow. So one weird thing that happens when you've got viscosity is that if your fluid starts moving fast enough, all of that rubbing against itself as it moves eventually gets so severe that suddenly the fluid starts to rotate and you get turbulence. Um, so next video, we're going to just take a wee bit of a look at turbulence and a little number that tells us whether we're going to have turbulent flow or not. So we'll see you in the next one. Kakiteano.